my presentation is a little bit more functional, how Bitcoin enforces its fixed supply. Now, this is a this is actually a really, really deep question that can get technical very quickly. And what I would like to do is present for about 15 minutes at a very high level, kind of tell a story, and then open up the floor for questions. So who am I? I'm Phil Geiger. I'm the VP of product marketing at Unchained. Um, I've been studying Bitcoin for coming up on 10 years. And I focus a lot on the economics and the education um, side of it. So how it works, why it works. Uh, I have over six years of professional experience at Unchained, uh, or in Bitcoin in about five years at Unchained. And I've spent about five years in Austin. Um, and I've personally helped onboard hundreds of individuals and businesses to controlling the keys to their Bitcoin wealth, to storing Bitcoin in their treasury. So what am I going to talk about today? Um, first, a two-word answer to how Bitcoin enforces its fixed supply. And this might be a controversial answer, so we'll see. Then I'm going to break it down and share some evidence. And then I'm going to give a gentle explanation of the technicals. Um, you can... You can study the technicals for years, and there's, you know, I've been studying them for years, and I still have a long ways to go before I can deeply, deeply understand the technical side of it. So, what I would like to do is just at a high level talk about how Bitcoin enforces its supply and then open up the floor for conversation. All right. So, our two word answer for how Bitcoin enforces its fixed supply of 21 million Bitcoin participants, the people who participate in Bitcoin are what enforce its fixed supply of 21 million. Before I move on, I want to compare that to the US dollar. Who enforces the supply of the US dollar? The Federal Reserve. 12 people in a room. They get to decide. With Bitcoin, every active participant is making a choice to enforce this fixed supply of 21 million. People most commonly get into Bitcoin because it increases in value over time. Let's just get that out there, right? Number go up is what it's called in Bitcoin. Uh, people buy Bitcoin because they think that it is going to increase in value. Now, why does it increase in value? Parker did a great job explaining that. Bitcoin increases in value over time primarily because of its fixed supply of 21 million. That is the foundation upon which kind of all of the other reasons are built. So essentially, getting Bitcoin is either knowingly or unknowingly a vote for this fixed supply of 21 million. It is a choice that you are making to say, I want to participate in this form of money that has a fixed supply, as opposed to the existing fiat currencies, which are managed by the central banks. We need to define Bitcoin participants uh, a little bit more, though. These, these are kind of from a high level, the people who participate in Bitcoin. I would consider them kind of the people who are enforcing the fixed supply of 21 million. Those who own Bitcoin. You might just have it on a mobile phone, or uh, you might control the keys to your Bitcoin with a hardware wallet. People who mine Bitcoin. So these are folks that are working in the space, uh, that are spending electricity directly to help process Bitcoin transactions. People who run the Bitcoin software. So you can run the software at home. Very easy. It's just like installing any other software program. Just download it, run it on your computer. Those are people who are helping to enforce the fixed supply of 21 million. People who engineer the software. So obviously the developers who are working to make improvements to Bitcoin. Uh, developers who are uh, making improvements to securing Bitcoin. All of those folks are helping to secure the supply. And then... Even just folks who work for Bitcoin companies or sell and trade things for Bitcoin. So if you have a company and you want to just sell something for Bitcoin or if you want to trade uh, your services for Bitcoin, you are also helping to enforce the supply. To recap and said differently, Bitcoin's supply is enforced by social consensus, the people, technical consensus, the software, miners, and supported by real world energy expenditure. So you've heard of Bitcoin miners as securing the Bitcoin network. That's the real world energy expenditure. You are spending energy in order to process Bitcoin transactions. And all of these things together are what are enforcing the supply. 
Before I dive deeper into the technicals, I'd like to take a step back and uh, give an example of where this was all um, this all happened in practice in Bitcoin. So in 2017, there were a group of Bitcoiners who wanted to make a change to Bitcoin. They wanted to change some small feature, and the feature isn't even that relevant, but the feature would uh, would basically be incompatible with the existing Bitcoin software. This was a group of the largest miners and business owners in the Bitcoin space. And the, the copy that they made is still out there today. It's called Bitcoin Cash. The software was 99.9% .9 the same, and they had significant backing of real-world energy. This is a, I believe it's a New York Times article from 2017. Now what happened? Bitcoin Cash is an unmitigated failure. They took a copy of the technical side, they took a lot of real-world energy, but what they can't take with them are all of the other participants, all the people who store value in Bitcoin, um, the people who opt into Bitcoin. They were out of social consensus. The Bitcoin users rejected this attempt to create more than 21 million Bitcoin and sold the Bitcoin that they, the, the BCH that they got for free for more Bitcoin. Uh, and you can see that in the, the Bitcoin cash price chart really early on. It was... The copy of Bitcoin was made December, uh, actually a little bit before this, but this is when it, the price was listed. Um, and it pretty immediately went to essentially zero. It's like lost 99% of its value. Again, the entire database of Bitcoin was copied. Miners moved over to this new product. Why didn't it succeed? Because people chose not to hold it. In fact, they chose to sell it. Um, I was one of those people. As soon as I was able to sell it, I sold it for more Bitcoin. All right, now I'm going to dive in a little bit to the technicals, just gently. Um, but how does Bitcoin software enforce 21 million? So among uh, many other things, it spells out the supply directly in the code. The software that you can run at home has in the code, it says, this is the number of Bitcoin that will ever exist, and this is how they will be issued. The software that you can run at home verifies the entire ledger of transactions since 2009. So anytime there's a transaction, your software at home will check and be like, yep, this is valid, follows all the rules, I'm going to include it. It also allows you to prove to yourself that you have gen genuine Bitcoin in your wallet. Think about really verifying any other form of savings like gold. If you wanted to prove that the gold bar you have in your you know, safe was real, You'd have to buy extremely expensive equipment, many thousands of dollars, to prove that it's real. In Bitcoin, you can verify to yourself that it's real on a Raspberry Pi, which is like a really, really cheap piece of computing uh, hardware uh, you, on your laptop at home. You can download the entire history of Bitcoin and prove you have real Bitcoin. And then additionally importantly, the software that you can run at home rejects invalid Bitcoin and then it bans the person who tries to send the Bitcoin. So when the folks created a, a copy of Bitcoin, Bitcoin Cash, they tried to send uh, a Bitcoin Cash transaction over the Bitcoin network, it would be banned. Nope, not accepted. There's a really, really good article uh, that was released actually around the time uh, of the, the Bitcoin Cash fork called Bitcoin is an Impenetrable Fortress of Validation. This is a visualization of... Uh, people running the Bitcoin software around the world. And at this point, there's you know estimated to be over 100,000 different copies of the Bitcoin software living all over the world. And these, again, are people who have the entire database of Bitcoin transactions. Like, think about if, you know, there, there isn't even a singular database of all of the US dollar transactions. And with Bitcoin, there's hundreds of thousands of copies or at least over 100,000 copies. And uh, anytime you try to cheat, you hit one of these red dots and you're rejected. So this is technically, um, at a very high level, how that supply is uh, enforced. So what do miners do? Again, we, many of us have heard, have heard that miners are the ones who are you know, creating Bitcoin and enforcing that supply. Uh, maybe a little bit controversially, I, I say miners don't at all create new Bitcoin. The software that you can run at home has already defined the Bitcoin. What miners do, is they're spending electricity to process the Bitcoin transactions and they receive Bitcoin as a reward. They get paid for, by, by Bitcoiners for helping to process transactions in the Bitcoin network. 
This energy investment is only valuable if there are users who deem it valuable. The, the computers themselves are just generating numbers. All they're doing is producing numbers. It's not valuable unless it is to support a fixed monetary policy, which then makes it maybe one of the most important usages of energy available. Uh, you're expending energy to, to ensure that the supply of money cannot be changed. So to recap, essentially a one-word answer to how Bitcoin enforces its fixed supply, and it's you. When you get into Bitcoin, you are choosing to opt into a monetary policy of 21 million. You're saying, not a fan of this QE infinity. I'm going to take my hard-earned wealth and I'm going to put it into this form of money that can't be changed. And I think we can expect this in the future, but economically, it makes sense for you to sell a copy of Bitcoin that attempts to change this monetary policy. Why would you want to opt in to having your own money debased? Especially if somebody will, will accept the copy of it and give you more Bitcoin for it, which was, again, really, really a nice part of the, the 2017 experiment. The Bitcoin software that you can choose to run defines the supply in the code, and it verifies the rules are being followed. You don't have to run the software, but as you start getting more into Bitcoin, um, it becomes kind of an interesting thing to try out. Again, it's very easy. It's just like installing any other program. It requires, I think at this point, about 600 gigabytes. I would just get a terabyte of memory, and then that's the entire database. Um, and, uh, I think like the new gaming consoles have more memory than one terabyte. So pretty astounding that a 15-year-old uh, monetary network is so small from a data storage perspective. And then you can additionally choose to mine Bitcoin by spending energy to process transactions and receive reward. You can also just pay an existing miner to do this, which is what I do. I don't mind. I just pay someone else to invest in energy infrastructure because I don't have any competitive edge on energy production. This activity, while you know a lot of maybe news articles will be like, this is a huge waste of energy, um, and I would completely agree with them, except for in this case, where it is spending energy to help support a fixed supply of 21 million Bitcoin. Spending energy to support the supply is, in my opinion, one of the most valuable use cases, cases of energy. Um, so it's, it's kind of interesting. I think miners that are working on other cryptocurrencies, I think that's a total waste of energy. Um, but for Bitcoin, I, I don't think that there could be much higher of a use for energy than ensuring that the money can't be debased. All right. And with that, thank you.